that's out there that knows what that family is going to deal with, that, what that husband and wife are going to deal with, what they're going to face as far as the, the uh, circumstances go. And, and they're a blessing and a help, and I appreciate those folks. And uh, we have quite a few of those, of those vision missionaries come through. They always have a great spirit. They've always been trained and taught very well, and I certainly appreciate that. I believe people that are serving the Lord, whether it be a missionary, a pastor, or a Sunday school teacher, a choir member, uh, a nursery worker or a uh, bus driver, whatever it may be. I believe we ought to give God our very best. I believe we ought to do our very best for the Lord. I don't believe that the Lord deserves our leftovers. I believe God deserves the priority and uh, to be the first priority. And, and I know many times that's challenging because we're so busy in life. I was saying to my wife uh, earlier this week, I said, you know, when we think about ministry, am I on here, sir? Good. When we think about ministry, Ministry is, is our life. I was speaking to my wife. I said, it's our life. It's what we do. I mean, that's what God has put in our heart to do. It's not a job. It's a calling, but that's what we do. And I said, you know, we have a church family, and I thank the Lord for our church family. Praise God for it. And uh, God has certainly blessed us. And uh, we have a church family. They, they get out, and they work 50 hours a week. They have a job. They have responsibilities. And they come in, and they want to serve the Lord and be a part of what God is doing. And uh, I said, I hope we always have that spirit, that attitude. Let me give God my best. Let me do my very best for the Lord. I would rather you do one or two things at your very best for God than to half-heartedly do three or four things. Just do your very best for the Lord. And whatever God has given you to do, do it. Uh, do it with all your might. And uh, God will bless that. We've been in 1 Timothy for two Sunday nights, or 2 Timothy for two two Sunday nights, and I told you on Sunday evening I was going to finish the message that I gave you on the last two Sunday nights that I was speaking, and, and we began three Sunday nights ago before we left for vacation uh, in 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I want you to look there, if you would please, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, and I'm going to read uh, one verse out of chapter 1, and then we're going to move to chapter 2. So 2 Timothy chapter number 1. How many have your Bible? Say Amen. Matter of fact, how many have your Bibles? Let me see them. Hold them up there if you would, please. If you have your Bible. Amen. Very good. 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Look in verse number 11. Verse number 11. Let's, let's read uh, verse number 8. We'll start reading in verse number 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Now, I said on Sunday evening, we understand that when uh, we speak of a testimony and we speak of your testimony... And what, what your testimony is, our testimony is what people know about us. Amen? Your testimony is what people know about you. And the Bible says that Paul told Timothy not to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. So when we refer to the testimony of the Lord, how do we know what we know about God? Let me say that again. How do we know what we know about God? Through His Word, right? So he said, don't be ashamed of the Word of God. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Look in verse number 8 again nor of me, his prisoners, but be thou a partaker of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. Stop right there. We mentioned this on Sunday evening. I want to hit it real quick. God did not call you based upon your abilities. Whether you have the ability or you do not have the ability to do what God has called you to do does not determine whether you should be obedient or not. You should be surrendered and obedient to the Lord's will, to whatever He has called you to do. And so he said, it's not according to our, our abilities. He said, not according to our works. He said, but according to His own purpose and grace, which is given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Verse number 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Aren't you thankful for the gospel? We'll never stop preaching the gospel. It is the gospel that saves the souls of man. We thank the Lord for it. Verse number 11. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And we dealt for the last two Sunday evenings on this thought, what your pastor wants you to know about the Christian life. What I want you to know as your pastor, what I want you to know about the Christian life. And we went through 
2 Timothy chapter number 1, and we pointed out 12 things that he shows us in 2 Timothy chapter number 1 that Paul says he was appointed to give to Timothy. Look in chapter 2, verse number 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard among me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul said, listen, Timothy, I want you to take what you've been given. And I mentioned this on Sunday evening. I'm just reiterating it for those that were not here. Paul says in chapter number 2, verses, verses number 2, verse number 2, chapter 2, verse number 2, Paul speaks of four, gener- four spiritual generations. He says the first one there is thou. He said you. Everybody take your finger and point it at yourself. Thou. He said you. He said the other generation is the things that thou hast heard among of me. He says so there's me, Timothy, and he said then there's you. And he said, continue on please. The same commit thou to faithful men. He said, so Timothy, I have taught you things. Paul says, I've taught you things. That's generation number one. He said, I've taught those things to Timothy. That's the second generation. He says, Timothy, you're to teach those things to faithful men. That's the third generation. Look, please, in the latter part of the verse. Who shall be able to teach others also? He says, I have given you something, Timothy, but I have not given it, given it to you so that you can hoard it. He said, I've given it to you so that you can turn around and teach it to faithful men who will be able to in turn teach others also. Well, we have a great responsibility with what God has given us. We said that the things that God wants us to know or the things that the pastor wants us to know about the Christian life, and I'm going to just go through them, read them to you very quickly, just so you can get them if you weren't here. If you, if you don't have them, they do have a list. There is a list that's posted on social media. You can go and get the list. But the very first one is found in verse number 1. Look what the Bible says. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. The first thing that your pastor wants you to know is this, that you desire the will of God for your life. Every one of us should desire to do the will of God. To be involved in what God wants us to be involved in. Listen, God does not, it is not man that calls us to serve the Lord. God calls us to serve the Lord. Understand this as well. When we're disobedient to that, we are first disobedient to the Lord. We're first displeasing to the Lord. We're first dishonoring to God. It is God that has called us. It is God that has appointed us. It is God that has said, this is what I want for your life. And every Christian should seek and desire to live in the will of God. Every one of us should desire to live in the will of God. Now, I said this on Sunday, and I want you to get it again. It is not our responsibility to fix blame to the past. It is our responsibility to set the course for the future. So with what God has given us, we can look back, and if we're not careful, we can fall into the trap that so many of us sometimes fall into of, looking back and blaming everything that happened behind us on why we cannot do what God has put before us. Let me say that again. If we're not careful, children, young people, listen to me. Don't fall into the trap of blaming everything that happened behind you and using it as an excuse on why you cannot accomplish what God has set before you. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the power of love and of sound mind. No matter what has happened in the past, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Some of the most... Some of, the, some of the happiest, or should be the, the happiest people on the face of this earth, should be the people of God. Why? Well, our, our, our sins have been forgiven. Right? Aren't you glad that as a Christian, that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, has cleansed us from all unrighteousness, has cleansed us from all sin? Our sins have been forgiven. What has God said? He said, I've taken your past, and I've removed the excuse on why you cannot do what I've put in your heart to do. And so when we think about the Christian life, it should be our desire to live in the will of God. And yet sometimes so many of us portray the will of God as the most miserable place on the face of the earth. And I'm not standing here as if I've accomplished or arrived and never deal with any of that. But listen to me, God's people are to love being where God wants them to be. We've spoke of this often, but, but you'll find that Lot got himself in trouble when he fell out of love with where God was blessing him and he fell in love with the things of Sodom. Somebody says, well, I, you, know, uh, you know, I just, I love the Lord. You know, sometimes you can love the wrong things. Right? 
That's why the Lord tells us, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He said you can't love the world and you can't love God at the same time. You can't do it. And so when we think about the Christian life, I want you to get number one. Do the will of God for your life. Live in God's will, knowing what, God's want, what God wants. Well, I don't know, Pastor Brian, what God wants for my life. There's a general will of God for everyone. And if we're not willing to be obedient to what God expects of all of his children, don't expect God to show us any special favors on what he wants us to do specifically. And so do the will of God. I'm just going to read these very quickly. I want you to remember number one. But I, number two, we said to live with a pure conscience. Write verse number two down. Number three, have a grateful spirit. Write verse number three down. Number four, recognize the power of prayer. Write down verse number three. He says, number five, the joy of the Lord gives, the, the joy the Lord gives is greater than any heartache we will endure. Verse number four. May history record that we were Christians of great faith. Verse number five. Remind yourself often of who you're living for. Verse number six. What God asks of us is not produced by us, it's produced by God in us. Verse number seven. Don't forget this one. Verse number eight. The Bible is the truth. It must always be your guide. The Bible is the truth. It must always be your guide. We would save ourselves much heartache if we dealt with the issues, disagreements, challenges, arguments in our life, if we dealt with them based upon how God's Word said we are to handle them. We save ourselves much trouble. Look at, verse, look at the next one, uh, number 10. The gospel is the greatest need of every man. Verse number 9 and 10. What your pastor wants you to know about the Christian life, that the gospel is the greatest need of every man, verses number 9 and 10. Look at number 11. You have a blessing in a pastor. Love him because he loves you. Verse number 11. You have a blessing in a pastor. Love him because he loves you. Listen to me. There, there is no king but Jesus. Jesus did not say, if the pope, the bishop... The pastor be lifted up. Jesus said, if I be lifted up. But you go back to verse number one, and Paul says, I'm appointed a preacher. I said this on Sunday evening. I love doing what God has called me to do. My wife and I were talking to each other on the way back from Destin, Florida. And we were talking to each other, and uh, we were interviewing each other. And we were asking each other questions. And one of the questions was, if you could be anyone, who would you be? And I said to her, I would be exactly who I am right now, just 20 years earlier. Well, I wish I knew at 20 what I know now at 40, 42. I wish I knew at 20 what I know now. But I love doing what God's put in my heart to do. God, why? Because God put it there. I remember preaching in nursing homes. Man, I was talking to a young man just recently. He was, he, the Lord had called him to preach, and he doesn't attend church here. He attends church in Kentucky. The Lord had called him to preach, and he said, the pastor gave me an opportunity to preach at the nursing home. I said, man, that's one of the best places to learn to preach. Why? Because everybody falls asleep and nobody's listening. You can practice your craft, man. It's great. And uh, listen, I love doing what God's given me to do. But love your pastor because he loves you. He's a blessing. Look in verse number, look in verse number uh, 13. Number 12, write this one down. Don't forget this one either. The first one and the last one, from a practical standpoint, are the most important in the Christian life. The most important one on this list is the gospel is the greatest need of every man. But practically, these two from a church perspective. Number 12, write this down or get it. Build upon what you've been given so that the next generation can build upon what you leave. Build upon what you've been given so that the next generation can build upon what you leave. Look what he says just, just very quickly in verse number 13. Hold fast the form of sound words. There is no substitute for Bible preaching. You do not need to water down the Bible so that it is attractive to men. You do not need to make Christianity more like the world so that more people will attach themselves to it. That's not Bible Christianity. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which is committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. 
we're not careful, we'll let some things go that we should be holding on to. We'll turn our back on some things that we should be grasping on to and standing on. So build upon what you've been given so that, those, so that you can leave something for the generation that comes behind you to build upon. So where do we go from here? There are the things that Paul gave Timothy. There are the things that the pastor gives us to, to know about the Christian life. So what do we do with that? You know, knowledge by itself accomplishes nothing. Right? There have been people who've been trained a lot to do a lot of things. We've got people who've got all kinds of degrees that have been trained to do a lot of things that have never done anything they've been trained to do. Right? Listen, there's somebody who knows how a, how a tractor is supposed to work, but I just go ahead and trust the farmer and, and believe him. Amen? Why? Because he's used the thing. He knows how it works. So it's not that we just have knowledge. What do we do with it? Well, he tells us that in verse number, in chapter 2, in the beginning of chapter 2. Look at it, if you would, please. Thou, therefore, he gives this list to us, and he says, Thou, therefore, thou, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Now, I'm going to take about 12 minutes, and I want to give you why, what we're supposed to do with what we've been given, okay? Look what the Bible says in verse number 1. He says, Thou therefore, I want you to mark the next two words. What are they? My son. Thou therefore, my son. Who do we call our, as sons, we understand that when we are called a son, it is because we have a father. Right? He says, my son. And that father represents Many things in the life of that child. It represents the authority. Right? How many had a daddy? Every one of you raise your hand because you had one. All right? You had a daddy. That daddy represented authority. That daddy represented leadership. That, that daddy represented in your life that position that you were to be submissive to. Right? Now, I know in the world we live in it's different. But... Daddy's the leader. He's the authority. He's the guide. And Paul refers to Timothy as my son. So when we look at this passage of Scripture, here's the first thing that I want you to get. God has given us all of this. God has put all of this in our life. He's given us this through His Word. He says, I've given you a pastor. I've given you a preacher. Here's what the preacher wants you to know from the Word of God about the Christian life. But if you're going to get it, first of all, you have to be willing to be led. You see, the son gets himself in trouble when he doesn't listen. Many of us know that practically. That Listen, some of the, some of the worst whippings I ever got were times that I just directly disobeyed what I knew Daddy told me to do. And boy, we get ourselves in trouble when we know what God wants us to do as the son. We have a father. As the son, we know what God wants us to do, and yet we get so busy and so, so, so. And listen, I remember times when daddy would say, hey, I want this done. I want this done when I get home. My dad used to play mind games with us. So I want this done when, he, when this gets home. And I would forget about it until I saw the car drive up. When we moved here, we had a green, I was, I was four, we, we had a green Buick Century sedan. It had plaid Vinyl interior. Green. Green plaid, didn't it? Oh, man, probably, probably had more steel in that car than you got in probably every car out in the parking lot tonight. Amen? Listen, you could get in a wreck in that and didn't even have a dent in it. Amen? We cut seat belts out. Laid in the back window. That was safety. Amen? I remember when Daddy would say, I want this done, and I'd forget about doing it until the car pulled up. And by that time, it was too late to rush around and get it done. Then you had to play the mind game. Is Daddy going to remember? He tried to hold out. He didn't forget too much. Why did we get in trouble? We neglected to be, to be led. You know when we get ourselves in trouble? When we forget we're the son. We're not the boss. With a son. He said, thou therefore my son. He said, I'm the authority, I'm the leader, I'm the guide, 
I'm the, I'm the uh, director. I'm the one that's going to put you in the right place. He said, but you got to be willing to be led. But we have a hard time just surrendering, don't we? The second thing that I want you to see, he says, thou therefore, my son, what do we do with what we've been given? Well, we've got to be willing to be led. So we have to understand that what God has given us is always best. Look what he says next, please, there. He says, thou therefore, my son, what are the next two words? Be strong. Be strong. You will never accomplish God's will for your life successfully without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Can't do it. You will never be what God intended for you to be without that personal walk with the Lord. Here's what happens without the personal walk for the Lord. The service for God becomes a duty rather than a blessing. Without your personal walk for the Lord, your service for God becomes a drag rather than an enjoyment. Without a personal relationship with the Lord and remembering why you're doing what you're doing, we, we, we learned all about that. Without understanding why we're doing what we're doing, it won't be long and you'll want to walk away from what you're doing. He says, be strong. Look what he says. Be strong in the grace of that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So we have to be willing to be led. We have to have that personal relationship with the Lord. If we're going to accomplish all this, if we're going to possess this, if we're going to live by what God has given us, then we have to let God lead us. And we understand that when God leads us and we're obedient to Him, that we're strong in the Lord. Listen, I'm not here pastoring because... You want me to be here. That's a blessing. But I'm here because God called me here. God placed me here. I said on Sunday evening, I believe before the foundation of the world, according to the Bible, I can show you where God had a perfect plan for Brian Cooper before the foundation of the world. And I believe that this is God's will for my life. So when I, when I look at what God has given me to do, you know what I'm learning more and more every day? The, the more that I try to serve God... And listen, I, I fail and falter and struggle just like everybody else struggles. But the more that I try to serve God, the more that I understand the longer I do it without Him, the weaker I become. But the more that I'm surrendered to Him, the stronger that I am. He said, be strong, Lord. He says, my son, be willing to be led. He said, be strong in the Lord. Then look what the next, the next thing that he says. You'll find the letter S in all of these. He says, and the things which thou hast heard among me, among many witnesses. What are the next two words? The same. We don't have to change the message. We do not have to adapt to the culture. I want to be a church of the 21st century. We ought to try to be a, a New Testament church. The first century church. We ought to strive to be more like the church Christ wants instead of the church the community wants. Let me back that up again. We ought to strive to be more like the church Christ wants instead of the church the community wants. Listen, if we're trying to impress men and please men, we've got our priorities wrong. We've got our purpose out of line. We're not even going the right direction. He said, he said the same commit thou to faithful men. Same Bible. Amen. Same truth. We don't have to change. Same purpose. Hey, what are we doing? What's the goal? What are we trying to do? Point people to Jesus Christ. Bring men to Christ. If we ever become anything, we've ever become too important to do those things, we're not a church. He says, the same commit thou to faithful men. I hope, I said to you, the last thing that I gave you there, number 12, uh, the last thing I gave you was build on what you've been given so that the next generation can build upon what you leave behind. I hope that in 50, 60, 70 years from now that there's a preacher up here with a little bit of gumption about him, preaching the same Bible we're preaching today. Yeah. Preaching the same message and the same truth. But it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to happen when God's people de determine to do the same thing that God has given us to do. There's pressure from all sides. All kinds of things. Hey, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. I saw an article just today. Seven things you need to do to keep people happy in your church. And I thought, Lord have mercy. Seven, that's it? <laughs> we need to quit worrying about keeping people happy and keep Jesus happy. Amen. The same commit thou to faithful men. Look what the Bible says. 
keep going here. I told you 12 minutes. I got about a minute. The same commit thou to faithful men. Look what the Bible says. Who shall be able? Who shall be able? Well, I just can't do it. Not according to the word of God. It's just too tough. It just doesn't work that way anymore. Not according to the word of God. That's just, it's a different world we live in. Not according to the word of God. Who shall be able? In other words, God said all those things that I've shown you, that I've given you, he says, for all of you who want to use the excuse and say, I just can't do it, then you just call God a liar. Because God said, you'll be able. Who shall be able? You're not going to be able to do it like you want to do it. You're not going to be able to do it uh, the way you think it needs to be done. You're not going to be able to do it in your own strength. But if you'll be strong in the Lord and you'll let God lead you and you'll, you'll pass down the same thing that God has given us, God said, you'll be able. It'll work out just fine. Many of us think that when trouble comes along or trials come along, many of us think, well, I'm out of the will of God. When it becomes a struggle, we think, well, I'm out of the will of God. Well, listen, you go to the Bible and you study how many people who face struggles and trials and dark times in their life that were right where God wanted them to be. Here's David, who is already anointed to be king. And here's Saul chasing him, trying to kill him. He's running for his life. We say, look, Pastor Ryan, he couldn't do it. No, no. David was learning some things. God was teaching David some things. Sometimes God will show you what you should do. But sometimes he'll show you what you shouldn't do. God says, I'm going to let you see this. I'm going to let you go through this so that you understand that when you have to deal with it, when you have to walk through it, when you have to help somebody through it, here's how you shouldn't act. Be very careful about pointing a finger at people's problems. Well, if it was me, I would do it. Well, you better be thankful, number one, that it's not you. But if it were you, you ought to respond the way God wants you to respond. He said, you shall be able. God says, all the excuses we use on why we can't. I said on Sunday night, people say, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. My wife said to me today, she said, honey, she said, we need eight people to work at Kids Point. I said, baby, how many workers do we have in Kids Point? She's, I said, we only, she said, we only have 12 total. I said, what happened to the other eight? I'm too busy. I got this going. I got this going. Do you know that the days, the hours in a day have not changed from the time you weren't busy? The number of days that you've been given, there aren't any more or any less days. It's not, it's not time. It's priority. It's priority. There's so many other things we've got that are more important to God than God is. You say, I can't do it. That's not what God said. He said, you shall be able. You shall be able to teach others also. You shall be able to do what God has given you, what God has shown you in his word. You can do it. And God said, there are four generations. In, in one verse, Brother Elmer, gives us four generations. And we wonder, we wonder why we have generation after generation. Listen, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. God said, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. But can I tell you, God's people are to become more strong in the Lord tomorrow than we are today. That our faithfulness to the Lord ought to be greater tomorrow than it is today. Why? Because we've seen God see us through today. We've seen God allow the sun to come up and we deal with the struggle. And the sun came down and guess what? The sun goes down and guess what? It's going to rise again tomorrow. God has seen us. Christians are not go the way of the world. We aren't going to become too busy for God and too tired for God and, and too, too this or that for God. We are to be more faithful to God as we grow old, as our time goes forward. You shall be able. He said you have to be willing to be led, my son. He said you have to be strong in the Lord. I have to understand you can't do it in your own strength. You have to do it in the Lord's strength. He said you have to commit the same thing. Don't try to give them something different. Just give them the truth. And God says, you can do it. It can be done. You shall be able. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being good to us. Thank you for blessing us.
Lord, I pray this evening that we would be honoring to you, that we'd be helpful.